Hi, in this presentation, I'd like to walk you through the basics of doing a research plan toward your dissertation or other projects that you'd like to do, but I'm really focusing this on uh, the early uh, dissertation phases leading toward your dissertation proposal. So um, here's the basic process that you need to think about. And if it's you're working on your dissertation, work closely with your committee, in particular your dissertation chair, as well as your methodologist as you're going through this. You should think about what your focus is on your dissertation. So in other words, let's say hypothetically you're writing a topic about literacy gains of elementary students um, in a particular intervention. Uh, that's being given, right? Um, so what do you mean by literacy? How, what specific area of literacy? Phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. Literacy is too broad. Um, so, And then how are you going to determine um, of what you're testing? Uh, if you're testing, let's say, phonemic awareness, what aspect of phonemic awareness are you going to give post-test, pre-test? Are you going to uh, make qualitative, quantitative? All of that depends on what you want to do, but it starts with what's your focus? You need to go into clarifying theories. Be sure to watch an associated video that I've also made about the difference between theoretical and conceptual frameworks and how to define that theoretical and conceptual framework because you do need, there's a big difference between, for instance, behavioristic theories and social cultural uh, theories. Uh, there's a big difference between different theoretical models and frameworks of reading that might guide your dissertation. And your dissertation needs to be consistent uh, with a particular theory. Now the theory that is appropriate for you depends not just upon like your level of comfort based upon the, uh, the professors that you've had or not just based upon what the favorite theory is of a particular professor. That's not what you should be looking on. But for the particular focus of your dissertation, um, what theory uh, best goes into that? Uh, for instance, if you're talking about dyslexia, uh, there are certain theories of literacy that tend uh, to get drawn in uh, to dyslexia. Um, you know, for instance, the uh, look into what's behind the International Dyslexia Association's definition of dyslexia, for instance. Um, so you get what I'm saying. You need to be consistent here. From there, uh, go into identifying your research questions. Your research questions are driven by the focus, right? Um, so, and your research questions are going to determine what method is appropriate and what method is not appropriate. Too many times I see students going into a dissertation uh, saying that they are going to use X method or Y method, but they haven't chosen their question yet. Um, the method that's appropriate depends upon what your question is. Uh, there are some questions that are more appropriate for qualitative. There are some questions that are more appropriate for quantitative. It's not that quantitative or qualitative is best compared to the other, It's but quantitative does a better job of, ask, of answering certain questions. Qualitative, uh, uh, you know, the numerical type questions. Qualitative does a better job of, of addressing the descriptive questions, the thick, rich detail of the social and cultural and situational context. Um, if you want to get into mixed methods, mixed methods, uh, which uh, combines quantitative with qualitative, mixed methods can get into both the numerical as well as the thick, rich detail of the situational context. But again, that which method is appropriate depends on your questions that you're asking and the theoretical framework. Um, also will shape what's appropriate. There are some approaches to methods that are more appropriately driven by the sociocultural uh, theoretical framework, other methods that are more appropriate for, let's say, a behavioristic uh, framework. So you need to be consistent here. Uh, for instance, if you're drawing on frameworks that draw on activity theory, that's sociocultural. Uh, then, of course, we get into 
uh, your research design. How are you going to collect data? How are you going to analyze data? Um, the methods section is going to be, that's chapter three in your dissertation, is going to be the heart and soul of whether you've got a passable dissertation proposal or not, and whether you've got a passable dissertation or not. Uh, a committee doesn't have any business um, allowing a proposal to move forward if the research design is weak, because that's where you can wind up spending a long time on a dissertation that you may never finish if the dissertation uh, question is weak. What I recommend you doing is I recommend you working on chapter one and chapter two simultaneously with each other because how can you come up with a decent research question if you don't understand the research literature? You can't. Um, how can you identify um, the gap in the research uh, that you're looking for if you don't have a clue on what the literature holds? You need to be iteratively um, going through the literature which goes into chapter two as you're looking on chapter one as well. And then once you've got chapter one and chapter two solid, I, I recommend you working on chapter three with your methodologist. Um, I'm not that wild about situations where I sometimes see students working on chapter three, before, the method section before they really worked on chapter one and two, because too many times, you might have some ideas toward a method section, but you don't really know what your frameworks are. You don't really know what your theory, your theoretical framework is and all that stuff. And then you wind up reworking a bunch of stuff. I don't want to get into a situation where you've got hypothetically 80 pages written, but you might have to rewrite a bunch of stuff. That's going to frustrate you a lot. Um, you should think ahead of time before you even get to your um, get to your proposal phase, what expected findings do you um, think you, that you'll find out? What expected results? That gets into your hypothesized findings and hypothesized results. Uh, I can guarantee you, um, generally speaking, when you do your dissertation proposal defense, someone, probably me, is going to ask you about your hypothesized findings. Um, and these should be consistent with your theoretical framework. They should be consistent with what the research literature says, and they should be consistent with your questions that you're asking as well as your research design. Um, think ahead of time, even before you've gotten into chapter four, because remember chapter four is your findings, chapter five gets into your conclusions and implications. But even ahead of time, even as you're preparing for your proposal, you should give some thought to your expected implications for practice as well as implications for research and implications for future research. You should know ahead of time as you're working on chapters one, two, and three, what do you expect to find and what are some expected conclusions. Now granted, um, by the time you get done with chapter four, some of your hypothesized expectations might change by the time you analyze the data, but you should have an idea of what to expect. And so we get into research design. Now I'm just giving you an overview in this PowerPoint um, research design. I can do uh, separate uh, videos on exact research designs that go with exact um, methodologies. This is just an overview. Um, so research design in a nutshell is basically a plan for your study. Um, it's the overall framework for how are you going to collect and then analyze your data. Um, you think about how you're going to select the subject, um, how are you going to uh, uh, this identify the site of your research, um, how are you uh, going to have procedures for collecting and analyzing uh, the, uh, the data um, that are appropriate to your research questions. Uh, the goal is, of course, to provide results that are credible, uh, that are reliable and valid. Um, the research design basically bridges the research question with how are you going to implement your uh, study. So again, you need to uh, be very careful about selecting a focus. Oftentimes, when I'm working with a doctoral student on chapter one, um, select, just simply selecting a focus can be very challenging. Uh, for one thing, you need to think about the difference 
between a practitioner focus and a researcher focus. A practitioner focus is how do I improve the practice of teaching, right? How do I improve the practice of developing um, professional development? Now that can lend its way into research focus, but the research focus uh, gets into based upon the literature uh, that has been done in the research on practice. Um, how do I, how is this going to inform the field both in terms of research as well as in terms of the practice of teaching. So we need to think about your questions. Of course, the questions guide the research process. The questions guide the conduct of the, of the data collection, the analysis, as well as what you're going to write about. So your questions need to be very clear. They need to point um, away toward uh, the type of uh, dissertation you're going to write, a uh, quantitative uh, question or questions points its way toward quantitative methods. Qualitative um, would be more descriptive and that points its way toward qualitative. Ideally, uh, the type of questions lend itself to that and they need to be specific enough that they are measurable. Think of it this way, most of you, in fact, I'm assuming all of you that are going to watch this video are practicing and experienced teachers with probably um, a decade or two or even three of teaching experience. So in a way, it's comparable to writing good lesson plan objectives, right? Um, your lesson plan should, objective should point its way toward, um, toward your assessment. Well, same thing here, your research question uh, should point its way toward the method as well as how you're going to assess your questions. Um, in chapter one, you need to have a very uh, clear purpose and very clear goals for your study. As you work your way toward chapter two, and again, I strongly recommend working on chapter one and chapter two simultaneously. Um, you need to think about the framework of your study. You need to have a very clear focus and um, this should be tightly tied together with your theoretical framework. Uh, for instance, if you're, uh, if you're doing a sociocultural framework, drawing on the work of Vygotsky and stuff, uh, then the research literature that you're looking up would likely be tied to that theoretical framework. So you need to think about from there as we get into uh, both chapter one as chapter as well as chapter three, which is where your question comes in. Um, this involves a data-driven journey through which you explore practices and research implications. And what I mean by data, of course, data can be both quantitative data as well as potentially qualitative data. The research questions should be very specifically answerable. You don't want it to be so big that, might, that you might potentially take years uh, trying to address it. I don't want you to write the type of dissertation research question that could take an entire year to explore or perhaps years to explore. Uh, that can be a major mistake, but you don't want it to be yes, no type of things either. Um, you want it to be something that is readily addressable by solid research design. With your conceptual framework, this gets into what concepts guide your study or what theories support the underlying concepts. Um, you need to understand the literature in order to understand your concept. Because how can you understand if, like, for instance, if you're looking into issues related to science of reading, uh, hypothetically, well, from there, what concepts guide your study of the understanding of science of reading? What theories guide you? How are you defining science of reading? Um, what literature base? What are you defining? Uh, are you defining science of reading as basically in a behavioristic way? Are you defining it in a broad, in a more broad way? What aspects of literacy are you specifically looking into? You see what I mean? We need to be, we need to uh, hone things down here. With the research question, once a focus area has been selected and the perspectives and beliefs about the focus areas have been clarified, the next step is to generate a meaningful research question to guide your inquiry. If you're doing qualitative inquiry, 
And again, the appropriate research design is determined by your research question. Um, it's oftentimes conducted th uh, through intense contact with the field in a real life setting. Observational, for instance, or interview uh, would be example of qualitative. Uh, the role tends to be holistic or integrated overview into the study. Um, oftentimes, you're finding out what the perceptions of the participants are. Um, oftentimes, their themes will emerge from the data. Um, you might have open-ended or pre-identified a priori um, coding systems, for instance. Um, the focus of the research is often to understand how people interact in a particular setting. It's very descriptive. Um, you might have a, a qualitative case study, for instance, where you study a specific bounded system, or per, such as a person operating in a certain context or an institution um, operating in a certain context. You might do an ethnography, uh, where you explore the nature of a specific social phenomenon, often using a small number of cases. The case study, especially qualitative case study, um, excels at bringing us an understanding of complex issues in a particular context and the relationship among certain conditions or people within uh, that setting. Uh, the researcher uh, can often apply various methodologies, so you're pretty flexible in the methodologies that you can use in a case study. Uh, for instance, you can use ethnographic case studies, you can do phenomenological uh, case studies. Ethnographic means observation, phenomenological, of course, means means finding out what the essence of the experience is for those people going through a particular experience. Um, oftentimes it's used to figure out what's happening in a contemporary real life situation. You've got various types of qualitative inquiry out there. Phenomenology, grounded theory, as well as narrative analysis are just three of the multiple types of qualitative inquiry that can be appropriate for case studies. Next, uh, we'll briefly talk about quantitative inquiry. Quantitative inquiry gets into determining the exact facts and, and of course, numerical facts, determining relationships between variables, predicting outcomes. It's designed to ensure objectivity, generalizability, and reliability. Quantitative inquiry deals, generally speaking, with statistical analysis. Um, Oftentimes, we get into a null hypothesis, of course. Um, the results uh, tend to be considered scientific, uh, and the examples uh, are uh, driven by data. Oftentimes, you've got charts and graphs that will illustrate the data. Oftentimes, if you're doing quantitative inquiry, you might use random selection for research participants. That gets into empirical design studies, and this gets into oftentimes experimental or, or quasi-experimental research design. Um, oftentimes, you, for instance, might use a standardized questionnaire. You might use a particular intervention. And of course, mixed methods, as I was just saying, mixed methods um, deals with both qualitative as well as quantitative forms. So with mixed methods, you would want to, um, of course, introduce uh, the purpose and give background and context. You would want to uh, get into your descriptive data, your quantitative data, as well as your qualitative data, and tie it together with, with an overall analysis of the results and conclusions. Make sure the data used is um, able to represent what the researcher says it does. That gets into, into validity. And make sure that, uh, that you're confident about the accuracy of your data. That gets into reliability. Um, and there's, uh, there are tests and standards out there uh, for ensuring reliability and reliability that need to be followed. You'll work on this with your methodologist as you're doing a dissertation. Make sure that uh, that you plan a study that's very doable. That's uh, too often times um, a mistake that I see doctoral students make is they might come up with a plan of action, but it's too complicated. It's too broad. Um, so make sure that this is something that you can do uh, within the amount of time that you want to take for your dissertation. Um, now, there is something to be said for collecting enough data 
that you can continue to build on your dissertation and draw upon the data that you collect, um, let's say a year or two after you even graduate, uh, because especially if you're planning on being a professor at some point um, in the future, uh, there is something to be said for continuing to publish off the data that you collected in your dissertation. But again, you can work with your methodologist to ensure this. You need to make sure of your data analysis, what story is told by the uh, by the data. Um, figure out, oh, the, does the data confirm to your hypothesis or not? Why or why not? And finally, um, as you get into chapter, um, as you think ahead toward chapter five, think about the hypothesis for what summary uh, do you expect to find and what does this what might this say about future research that will be done? Okay, I wanted to make this a brief introduction. Hopefully it helped you. Take care.